the first slide is usually very important of any presentation, uh, whether it's a quote, uh, image. Uh, there's something that you know you want your audience to have a, an emotional reaction, and that's a word Sean said prior to uh, uh, us, uh, you know, starting this discussion. So what I've done is this is quite random. Uh, I decided to uh, find you know. 18 faces, I mean, as many as many that could fit on a slide. And they are random. And it was funny what I created. Because what I'm going to do is, as I read their names, it's important to say the names of the people, the mathematicians, and not have them as faceless, nameless entities. And to see mathematics as a rich collective. So as I go across from the top left-hand corner, um, you have Al Karizmi, uh, you have Aryabhata, you have Vascara, uh, you have my favorite mathematician of all time, uh, Sophie Germain, uh, Agnesi, uh, Evarice Galois, the far end of that first row. Uh, dropping down, uh, you have uh, Zhenyi, uh, the late uh, Iranian mathematician Merzakhani, uh, Shiji. Uh, Al Hatayam, which you know, uh, he's he's the one who gave us uh, all the rich exponent laws uh, back almost 900 years ago. Uh, Florence Nightingale, uh, probably the mother of data visualization, uh, the work she did. Uh, Hypatia of Alexandria, Pingala, Nother, Lovelace, Easley, Brahmagupta, and Ulimbeck. I, I'm not reading that off a list. Uh, I've done this presentation many times, and I want these names to be familiar. I want when you look at this picture, you see all the different photographs. And some are just sketches because you know there's obviously no photography back then. The different uh, clothing they wore, like it, it's it's a um, it's a very uh, intense visual of seeing all the different people that have. Well, I mean, a, a snapshot, and if you notice. Um, I've included, you know, a white male, Evarice Galois. Um, there's other uh, white mathematicians. I believe in the word and, not or. That we have to be more inclusive. We have to add on in terms of our story of mathematics. So one of the ma mathematicians I mentioned was Brahmagupta. And so this is kind of a macro, you know, I'll give you some, you know, some mathematicians. So I'm going to go now into uh, Brahmagupta. And I know you see nothing on the screen, right? Um, maybe, the, and I, I set this up this way, but I realized, you know, Brahmagupta is the one who gave us zero. And yes, there's nothing on the screen. Um, but here's a, a question we all done um, as, as teachers and our students do. So the way that we have learned this, the way I think historically most of us teach it is that we tell the students that the two minus signs make a plus. So that two plus five gives you seven. It's pretty much a, like that. It's pretty inert. It's a calculation and we move on. But because I said the word addition, we have to add to our history of mathematics. How about we add zero? Because this is what Brahma Gupta did. Because when you add zero, you do not change the value. It's one of the properties of zero. And I really highlighted the zero with a green. And you're thinking, okay, you add zero, what next? Well, don't we teach our students about zero pairing? Because the two is, if students go, okay, well, I can't, I don't have um, any minus fives to take away, right? I mean, think of them as objects. You want to remove these things, subtract these things called minus five. You don't have any. Well, why don't you go get some? Well, there you have it. But if you get a minus five, you also have to add five so you don't change what the question is. And this is historical. This is Brahma Gupta. This is not Sunil doing, you know, this is how Brahma Gupta intended the power of zero and integers. I mean, North America, we do positive numbers 
in first grade and then we do negative numbers five years later? That separation is because of a loss in translation idea of zero and how positive and negative in, uh, integers were supposed to be taught simultaneously. So if we follow through with this idea, you can see that we now have enough to subtract. I'm just going to rearrange this. Same object, take away same object, will give you nothing. And what's going to be left in the distillate of this is 7. Now, this took a little longer to explain. And I kind of, you know, weaved in a little bit of my own storytelling of learning about Brahma Gupta. But that's what, I mean, if you want to make the deepest connections, you have to tell stories. That's a quote from the Harvard Business Review. And this gets students also thinking about mathematics at a deeper level in terms of what's happening below the surface. I'll do another sort of micro level question. Um, this is one I've done in workshops. You know, uh, there's eight, there's actually eight steps in this picture. Uh, and I, I wanted to find, you know, uh, eight steps specifically, and it's specifically, uh, which has this sort of kind of architecture. You can probably notice maybe where, what part of the world is from. The question is, how many different ways are there to get up these eight steps? And what do I mean by that? That you're allowed to take one step or two steps. So yes, you can start writing out all the different solutions, like one, 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 one. And then the second one where you do a jump of two, that's a different way to get up these eight steps. The key thing is it's got to add up to eight. But you're allowed to take either one or two steps. Uh, there's also two, two, two. Um, if you were to do two, then one, 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 that's a different way to get up the steps. So how many different ways are there? Right? And you could do by brute force, and you know, you might probably get all of them except one or two, might do the same one over again, but there's got to be an easier way. So you always take baby steps. Right? Start with one. There's only one way. With two steps, there's two ways, one comma, one or two. It gets kind of, it seems trivial in the beginning, right? With three steps, there's three ways to get up, one, 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 two, one, or uh, one, two. Things get interesting at four. There's five different ways to get up these eight steps. I'm sorry, I realized that the five should have been under the total. And with five steps, there's eight different ways. So now some of you might be recognizing the sequence of these numbers. The next one's going to be 13 for six steps. And you're going, oh, this is Fibonacci, right? Fibonacci sequence of the rabbits. Fibonacci didn't discover <laughs> the Fibonacci sequence or this patterning. The mathematician who discovered it was Pengala, one of the ones I mentioned. Uh, he was a Sanskrit poet. Um, I think there's some evidence it might have been Himachandra. Either way, um, the root of uh, these the sequence, these numbers, came through Sanskrit poetry because Pingala wondered how many different poems can I write with long and short vowels uh, in Sanskrit poetry. So that's the same idea, the, how many ways can get up these eight number of steps with either one or two steps. That's 800 years prior to Fibonacci. So sometimes even the mathematics we teach isn't referenced entirely correctly. And this caused surprise. And then maybe it's like, okay, what else should we, should we fact check? And it creates curiosity, uh, not just among students, but for teachers as well. I didn't know about this till uh, maybe about a couple years ago. I was pretty sure Fibonacci was Fibonacci, but it, you know, I just stumbled through um, uh, American mathematician Manjula Bhargava, who won the Fields Medal in 2014. And uh, he was the one who explained the Sanskrit poetry background of these numbers. So uh, really fascinating in terms of where the roots of some of these ideas come from. Uh, I think some of you are familiar with maybe this passage. Uh, this is a book, uh, or maybe not. Um, usually when I do this, sometimes I show the book first, and then I, I choose the passage. I flip back and forth. Um, but it's heavily marked up. I mean, this is my own personal copy. And uh, so you can see that, you know, I've marked it up like any teacher does with a very interesting book. And I haven't given the title of the book. Um, some of you may recognize it. But the first sentence, uh, interest in history marks us for life. That, it doesn't, that sentence could be the opener for any kind of book which deals with any kind of history. 
And if you go on and read some parts in the passage, I circle the part, it excites our curiosity. Right? It excites our curiosity when we have this interest. And there's things like identity get fleshed out as well. So what is, where, is this, where is this from, right? Uh, it's from a book called Crest the Peacock. Um, I have all three editions. And this passage by uh, the author, uh, George uh, Jivergisi Joseph, is at the end of the book. Uh, it's near the end, and I pulled it out, and I, um, it really encapsulates the spirit of mathematics that has been done collaboratively and collectively. It doesn't matter where, if, you know, back when the math history books were written, you know, uh, maybe middle of last century, too often um, the authors, who were generally white males, if they if they even referred to the early origins of mathematics, they referred to them as crude. Well, every society that has learned mathematics has learned it for its uses, whether it be for the practical, if it's a hunter-gatherer tribe culture, um, the way that they use mathematics, you know, they're not doing STEM careers at that point, as I speak sarcastically. Um, even uh, Ramanujan, who I'll mention, you know, he was mocked for his sloppy methods and, you know, that he didn't have this sort of idea of proof and, and he was uh, also uh, giving a lot of his uh, work and intelligence to a deity. Well, that's a Western perspective. If there's a spirituality element of that why a, a person or a culture or a race uh, explored mathematics, then that is perfectly fine. We should be inclusive of all the different purposes of mathematics. In a Western society, a lot of it's driven by, you know, um, performance, and you got to get a job, and that's the purpose of mathematics. Well, what if you are, you know, you don't have access to an engineering career? What if you're incarcerated? You know, is mathematics only for a certain group of people? You know, we have to be a bit more expansive in terms of how we discuss mathematics. Um, you know, and we also have, a, a, you know, 100 generations of stories to tell. And this is from Mathagon. Uh, you know, so it's not just I, we all have to tell these stories. So, uh, and all math roads, they actually lead to this idea of humanization. This is what looking at a more a broad vision of math and history is going to do. You know, this picture of all roads do actually lead to Rome. Well, all roads lead to humanization. And you know, the, this is hopefully this word comes up because we talk about math anxiety, but precursor to anxiety is alienation, is math alienation. That sets in first and then it metastasizes to anxiety. And you know, that word in the previous slide, belonging, is the antithesis of alienation. We need our students to belong in the classroom. And uh, these are some uh, quotes from a book by Amy Alsnauer. Uh, she wrote uh, The Boy Who Dreamed of Infinity of Ramanujan. And this is where some of the ideas of math, of what a mathematician can come from, like, you know, a mistake maker, a dream catcher, things we never think about. And this, again, this comes from exploring mathematics through a wider lens of equity, diversity, and inclusion. You know, to, to include everyone, and we're not doing it out of some sort of uh, fabricated reason. This it was how mathematics, you know, the history of it has occurred. And sorry, there is the actual book. Uh, which I think it got long listed for a 2021 uh, picture story book uh, by uh, uh, I think the Subaru and some other publishing groups. A wonderful, wonderful book. Um, and since we are, I, I specifically love this slide at the end, uh, towards the end, you know, uh, and this fabric map of Africa, the, the, the indigenous uh, idea of fractals is so embedded in all various parts of Africa. And if you want to talk about cell phones, the fractal antenna, and you've got to talk about the Ethiopian cross 500 years earlier. You know, that image of the Ethiopian cross and the fractal antenna, so much of rich mathematics is actually in Africa. And, you know, the, the Ishango bone, the Bombo bone, I mean, there's, there's roots and we need students, you know, uh, our black students to feel like Africa had this rich contribution of mathematics. And this is like a, the last slide on this one. We can use this as... Um, as part of our discussion, uh, this pinwheel, this is what the power of storytelling, rich math history does. 
you know, all these things that we want to have are at our uh, disposal and access if we actually start to look at the rich ideas of math history. And it doesn't matter where you are, if you've never taught math history or it's been something you're maybe you're not, you feel you're a good storyteller, that's the imposter syndrome. You start there. And, you know, we're in a very exciting time. It's a very uh, troublesome and anxious time because of the pandemic, but it is a chance for us to think, uh, think things anew. So that